starting we're live hello everybody this is ray hey and i'm dan and we are the bearded men of real estate podcast welcome to our very first episode episode one uh dan who are you tell us a little bit about who you are i'm just dan no just, <laughs> we'll just cut it there <clears throat> it's my intro i'm done it's done uh <laughs> and you've got a beard that's all you <laughs> that's it my name's dan i'm a realtor beard boom podcast uh <laughs> Dan Ludwig, I work for a company called the Associates Realty Group. Uh, Southern California is where we're based. We have offices all over the place. Uh, San Diego is our kind of farther south, and then we have about four that are relatively close to where I, uh, <clears throat> my home base is. That's cool. Claremont, California is where I'm currently sitting. Um, and so a little about me, I wanted to go back through like why I became a realtor. I didn't have really like a history. I didn't have a parent that was into it. I didn't have a, you know, a good friend that was a mortgage guy. None of that. It was very simple. We sold our house in Pasadena in 2011 and I dug the process. Cool. It was, it was <clears throat> pretty simple. There was a, um, an agent and she owns three Keller Williams offices. Her name is Jane Parsons. Um, Phenomenal lady. She's just so cool. And uh, we, you know, when we're getting ready to sell the house, she just, it was just so impressive, man. She almost like, like floated into the room. Like, whoa. <laughs> it was just so impressive because she's done this for, you know, now she's probably 30 years in. Her son is super wow. successful um, and part of it. And then her husband is her partner and broker, you know, so the whole family. It was just so like, I, you know, because at the time, I had taken a layoff from um, the video game industry to stay home with my daughters. Wow. Um, so, and I was like, I, I didn't know if I was going to go back into, because I had operations management before that. And then, you know, um, production management or uh, project management is what I did at, in the video game industry. So what was I going to do? And I just see this super impressive, like, wow, that's cool. I want to do, I want to be that lady, you know? That's cool. <laughs> Obviously, I can't be a lady. Um, <laughs> bearded lady podcast. Yeah, a whole another show. <laughs> yeah, the bearded ladies of real estate. <laughs> We've already come up with our spinoff. Oh, yeah, um, yeah, like two minutes into our first podcast. Um, and and then just that was cool. She had a team, and it was just so impressive. She did the thing, and it was literally like there was not really an appointment. It was just oh yeah, this will sell for, and then whatever. This is adorable. This will sell for six, fifteen all day long, whatever it was. Wow. And I was like, you know, we're okay, cool. You know, we weren't going to interview other agents. She was just the best. And, you know, she if she didn't impress us, we probably would have looked into it, but she was just amazing. And then the process was just cool. I loved, you know, kind of the team aspect because I'm a team. I love being on a team. I love being part of a team. Um, and she, there was all, they all had their different pieces and they worked it perfectly. It was amazing. And then, like the negotiation process is really what it put, put it over the top for me. Um, and then, you know, it was the discussions with my wife. Is it a good decision for the family? Cause I can have more free time, be around my girls still. Um, Cause Ray, you've heard me say it a lot. Uh, I'm essentially a full-time stay at home dad and a full-time realtor. Um, and it's worked out great in the last five years. That's cool. And, and uh, yeah, just started studying and got my license. That was at the end of 2011. Then I started working when my daughters were two. So, so you've been um, in it for five years then? Yeah, started working. Yeah. This is your you know, sixth. Yeah, sixth. I started, I, I, I consider when I started working, um, the beginning of 2012, when I kind of started understanding it, because I started with Keller Williams, and just the, the, the classes and the bold and the everything and the atmosphere, it was perfect for new agents. I, I loved it for new agents. It was so good for me, so good for me. So, um, yeah, that's about me. Cool. Ray, who are you? Yeah, <laughs> I am Ray Ellen, a bearded realtor in Arkansas. I'm actually in Little Rock, Arkansas. We kind of service about four counties here locally um, with a group called The Property Group. Uh, we're just a small boutique firm. I used to be with, uh, I guess I was first licensed in 2007. I'd worked as an assistant before that. Oh, wow. So, yeah, and I, that was... Like uh, at the crash. <laughs> yeah, I guess wow. it was two years after college. Right. I graduated in 2004. I became a real estate assistant in 2006 because I've just always been fascinated about it. My grandparents owned timber property. I can remember as a kid, like going out and marking purple on the trees and scraping bark and talking about everything you could do with the property when you owned it. So I've just always oh, wow. kind of been fascinated about real estate, but no one in yeah. my family worked it. It was just kind of an enigma. And then, of course, you go through high school 
and you graduate, you go through college and graduate and you don't even know what a mortgage is. It's like, what's this yeah. mortgage everybody's talking about? So I began yeah. to educate myself a little bit on it, got, uh, got involved as an assistant first, just helping other agents market and sell their properties. And then uh, in 2007, January of 2007, I got my license because we had marketed over 49 million in property my first year in Arkansas. That's a big number. Um, <laughs> that's a really big number. Yeah. So, Knowing your median sales price. Yeah. That's yeah, great. Yeah. So I, I told, told my wife, I was like, you know, had I been licensed, our life would be way different. She was like, yeah. So I got my yeah. license. We had an incredible four months. <laughs> then the you world, mean right out the box? Yes. Yeah. We had an incredible four months. I've sold my first. Oh, yeah. Sorry, in a day. Yeah. yeah. I sold uh, like four or five other properties in the first couple of months. I had several lined up. And then the bottom just like totally dropped out that summer. Investors pulled back. Everything started pulling back. And up there, it, wow. it, I was in Northwest Arkansas at the time, and there were entire fields that would be grown up. And you kind of start looking, and you'd realize that there's curbs, and there are streets and sidewalks through this whole field. Oh. And it was wow. a development that had gone completely belly up. And they just walked away. I just walked away. Builders were, wow. yeah, that was happening a lot. So uh, wow. I actually hung with it for about a year and a half, two years, even through the crash. I got recruited by a business brokerage. I started doing that, wound up owning a couple of companies. To make a long story short, we were in Texas, wanted to move back to Arkansas. So I reactivated my residential real estate license in 2013. Uh, and uh, I guess that fall, I restarted this thing. So since then, we haven't looked back. I mean, the second, it's really funny. The second time you do something, I had totally different eyes when I was looking at everything. Like, yeah. you know, I would see something and instead of just seeing, oh man, this transaction didn't work out. I started asking a lot of whys, you know, why did this yeah. transaction not work out? What could I have done better? What could we have done better as a group? And then, you know, this yeah. one closed and everything went smoothly. I would also still ask why, you know, why was this one fantastic? And this one was a fantastic failure. And so that's, oh, that's good to look at why it succeeded as opposed to why only why it failed. Yeah. So I, yeah. I literally journaled those things. And today we have a team that's kind of running and operating those systems. We have a couple of buyer specialists with us, a couple of uh, uh, admins, and we have a videographer now. So everything, everything in real estate is kind of changing. We're, we're headed that direction, which kind of brings us to, yeah. I guess, why we are doing this. So um, yeah, Dan and I, I guess we, we hooked up on Facebook. <laughs> so he was in town. <laughs> so whatever you see a guy like Dan, and I think it was one of those real estate networking groups. And I saw Dan post something. And I was like, man, he looks just like the guy from GOT. And sure yeah. enough, I think I posted the picture of that guy, the big red beard dude. Tormund Giants. Yeah. Fan. Yes. That's his name. There you go. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and we started talking and chatting and realized we have a lot of the same philosophies, uh, similar ideas, but different approaches. And yeah. the more we talked and the more we brainstormed, the more we realized how much we were learning from each other. So, uh, yeah. what we thought about doing is creating just kind of a podcast where we jam on various real estate topics. And in doing that, the format that I think we're going to go with, and we're, you know, in the beginning stages, so we're testing this a little bit, but we're going to start yeah. with a headlines portion of the program where we're going to read fairly quickly through the main real estate headlines that we have found that week. And while these are the ones that we found that we think, Hey, these kind of have some gravity to it. We would also love to hear what everyone else thinks. So if you, sure. if you found an article or something, you're like, Hey, you know, this needs to get out there. More people should know this. Just shoot it to us. Uh, we'll be, we'll be happy to kind of talk about it and also give you a shout out for, for sending it our way. Um, this is probably going to be more or less an industry related podcast, less of a consumer related podcast, but there will be some interesting tidbits, especially for investors or people that are just kind of interested in real estate. Uh, but yeah. definitely if you're a real estate agent, we hope to cover some topics that are, that are going to be good for us as agents to know too. So the second yeah, and, portion, and, Oh, go ahead. Um, and just to get everyone talking, you know, cause I mean, honestly, since we've hooked up on Facebook, <laughs> <laughs> the conversations have been in so many different formats, all the different apps and messenger and just Facebook alone. And it's been constant between just you and I. Right. So, um, and then we have other, uh, colleagues that, that, chime in and it's a great flow. So yeah. we wanted to kind of bring this to, um, you know, to the masses, I guess, and, and, and really get that conversation going. And then yeah. it, 
simple bearded men of real estate. Be more. I love it. So the second, that's the, that's the thing. I love the be more thing. <laughs> so the second part uh, of uh, the show is we're going to pick out a couple of the headlines and so we're going to jam on those specifically. So we'll kind of uh, dig deep into a couple more of the topics, talk about our own personal experiences, how they relate. We'll probably have a couple of questions in there that we ask each other that we can't answer. So that's also the place for you guys to chime in and say, Oh, I know the answer to that one, or this has been my experience. We'd love to hear that too. So uh, without further ado, are you ready to get in the headlines? Yeah. All right, let's do it. And this is where I feel like I should have a transition. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> okay. A recent value insured study notes that consumers may be starting to worry about housing correction and believe that now is the time to sell. Joe Melendez, CEO of Value Insured, said that we see more home buyers concerned with the timing in the market. He went on to say this is especially true for millennials who are more likely to switch jobs, relocate, uh, or need to upsize in the next few years. No one wants to buy at the peak and find themselves underwater as so many did years ago, he said. So they in this study, 83% of Americans believe that now is the time to sell. 58% believed uh, that there would be a housing bubble and a price correction within the next two years. Yeah, now that bubble thing, because it bubble burst, obviously, like when you started in 2007, right. 2008, that's a scary term. Right. How he said the price correction, I think it's more going to be a correction because what was everything built on 10 years ago? Just yeah. crap. There's no good loans, not one. Right. But now, and it became so difficult to get loans. It has loosened up, I guess, in recent years, in the last two years from what I've seen, where it's a little easier, but there's still, you know, I mean, underwriters nowadays, they want a lot at the, at the you know, I get a lot of conditions yeah. at the end. They need, we need this, this, and this, another BOE uh, verification of right. employment. You know, how, so how many packages of unopened underwear are there in your underwear drawer? Yeah, they want everything. I need to know. <laughs> I need to know that. Is it Elmo underwear? Because yeah, we can't. We can't. No. You're, you are risk. <laughs> um, so to me, it's more of a correction or a, a plateau is kind of how yeah. we've been saying it to be not like a burst. You know, so I would almost say like a fear of it bursting is almost irrational would be my kind of. Yeah. Um, take on that, you know, and we'll jam on this and a couple more of the statistics that they shared at the uh, end of the show. So stay tuned. Yeah. Um, and then next Apple, I don't know if you guys have heard of this. First of all, have you guys heard of Apple? <laughs> <laughs> They're a newer company, you know, been around a couple of years. Uh, they released a new iPhone. Uh, big, big news. Obviously I see my feeds on all my different social medias filled with it. Um, Tuesday, Apple released its new line of products. The Apple three or Apple watch three better, faster. And now with the cellular built in, uh, the new Apple TV better, faster, now 4k, uh, and the new iPhone. So there's an eight an eight S and then an X or 10. If you want to be kind of the square <laughs> We cool people say X, <laughs> uh, <laughs> with no home button, which I think is an interesting yeah. like feature, like why it's such a big deal because my Samsung, uh, eight plus has no home button either, but again, we'll riff more. Um, and then, and the long awaited edge to edge display, which is, right. um, uh, so now some of you may be thinking, what does this have to do with real estate at all? So we'll get into that a little bit later. Yeah. So home prices jumped 6.2% in the second quarter, eclipsing a 2016 high. So in a report from the national association of realtors, the national median existing single family home price in the second quarter was 255,600, which is up 6.2% from the second quarter of 2016, which is 240 K and surpasses the third quarter of last year, 241 K as the new peak quarterly median sales price. Uh, the median price during the first quarter increased 6.9% from the first quarter of 2016 as well. So Lawrence Yun, uh, NAR chief economist says that home prices in most metro areas continued their fast ascent in the second quarter because the supply remained at pitiful levels. Yes, exactly. We're seeing the same thing here if we're just, you know, my local markets. And I think that kind of jumps off the other topic that we were just talking about with the, you know, millennials being afraid that there's going to be a bubble because things keep going up. It can't right. do that. You know, can it sustain that? Um, so recent research shows that homeowners who list their home for sale by owner in the industry, we call them FISBOs are not saving money. How true is that? Uh, in a report by Col uh, collateral analytics, they examined the price differentials for homes sold through trad traditional agents through the multiple listing service compared to FISBOs or for sale by owner sales for a variety of geographical markets with data from 2016 to 17. 
Uh, and then the quote is, we find that FISBOs tend to sell for lower prices than comparable home sales, and in many cases below the average uh, differential represented by, prevailing, by the prevailing commission rate. We improve upon prior studies by using an automated value model or AVM to control for differences in property attributes. And we'll, we'll touch on that actual uh, uh, yeah. model later. This is super interesting for me. So I can't wait to kind of dig into some of the details. It's a really interesting study. So if you haven't yeah. Googled the collateral analytics housing study, you should definitely do that and take a look at it. We'll Yeah, you're we'll definitely a numbers details. guy. And it, you know, I'm a numbers guy too, but not on your level, but it's it's a great <laughs> read. It's a great read. Yes, I'm a little more nerdy. <laughs> <laughs> so the National <laughs> Flood Insurance Program may be expiring soon. Or will it really? Mm. I mean, really, yeah. Right. Is it really? <laughs> really? With recent events, really, really, we can just leave it that really. <laughs> so the National Flood Insurance Program, or NFIP, is now less than one month away from expiration, raising concerns that homeowners and consumers and commercial property owners could find themselves either unprotected or unable to get a mortgage or underwater with no reprieve. I added that last part. This would affect yeah. roughly 40,000 <laughs> transactions per month, which is the exact reason why this will never run out. 40,000 right. transactions per month means property taxes for all local and uh, state levels. So there's no way that they're going to let this thing run out, but they all use it as a political football to toss it down the road. I think they already have something now that's a temporary reprieve for this. So I just don't see it yeah. happening, especially with Harvey hitting and Irma and all these people that are currently sitting underwater for this to run out at this time is like the worst time yeah. in history politically. It's political suicide. Yeah, it would be obviously just affecting 40,000 transactions per month. Think about the timing. Yeah. Even if they, you know, just push it through or get something, you know, a Band-Aid fix for now, it's the worst timing. Right. They, they, would, they, they would just be viewed as, I mean, geez, that would go up there on, you know, the views of, you know, horrible, horrible things to do at the wrong right. time. But the headline scared me, so I'll give them political money, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if For those people who don't read actual articles, oh my gosh. Uh, well, I guess I better throw money that way now. Um, so pending home sales lessened by 0.8% in July. Dun, dun, dun. Mm -hmm. uh, in a brief filed August 31st, NARS, NAR, National Association of Realtors, chief economist said that these pending sales were weaker in most areas in July as house hunters saw limited options for sale and highly competitive market conditions. The next pending home sales index will be released uh, later this month. So, um, yeah, I, I'll get into it a little bit later, but I'm a buyer's agent um, solely. I solely work with buyers. So mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of that, that limited options for sale. It's really interesting. I think these two studies go hand in hand together. The jump 6.2% yeah. in the second quarter, along with the home sales actually lessening 0.8%, which in reality, I mean, that's not, that's a 1%, the error, I wonder what the error yeah. of the study is, right? So 0.7%. <laughs> right. So it's relatively flat in the seasonality that it should be up. And that's that, that part's interesting too. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, the so headlines. Yep. Well, that's the headlines that we found for the week of September. What was Monday? I don't even know. Well, 14, 13, 12, 11. Yeah. No. So that's the headlines that we found from September 11th through September 15th. If you guys have any questions or suggestions about the headlines that we should have, just find us on the social media webs. <laughs> and we'd be happy to add some of those for next week. So let's get into some of the talking points. Transition. Ah, transition. We have to do the thing. <laughs> yeah. You guys are currently seeing us work it out as we go. <laughs> yeah, we'll figure all this out later. Yeah, we'll just stick with it, whatever. All right. So for the first main talking point, let's talk about that. Uh, the study released by Collateral Analytics that was the for sale by owners. Or we're going to call them FISBOs uh, probably most of the time. Yeah. Same thing for us. Yeah. So FISBOs were selling for less, which, you know, we've kind of always talked about in the industry. Uh, I can remember when I first got, uh, you know, when I was first involved, I would go over to somebody's house to actually take a picture of their house and shoot their house. And the guy was formerly for sale by owner and now he's selling. And, you know, we always heard that they were selling for less as for sale by owners they would in real estate uh, or with a listed with an agent. But one of the questions is um, one of the first things I always have to tell a for sale by owner home usually is that you have to drop your price because they're priced way out of the market, which is one of the reasons they don't <laughs> sell. Right. Yeah. But I'm curious to know how they figured this out. 
So first, what do you think? Uh, what's been your experience as a buyer specialist working on as the sole agent versus a FISBO? And then uh, what do you think um, about how they did this study using the automated valuation model? Yeah, so specifically about price, I'll start with because I'm, like I said, a buyer's uh, specialist solely um, and have been for five years essentially. Um, we just had one. We just had a recent, we meaning a client and I just had a recent, um, we had to cancel with a, with a FISBO. We got into escrow with them. Uh, we saw, we did see them on the multiple listing service. Um, they paid a broker like 150 bucks just to put it in the, in the MLS. And that's a catch right there. I'll come back to that in a second. But, you know, my client really liked the home. Uh, so I do what I do every time. If you take a home, if you like three of the five that I just showed you, I will send you comparables on all of them. And then we'll kind of get a top priority list and we'll offer. But this one, I run comps, overpriced. <laughs> it, it was just simply put. And it wasn't crazy overpriced. It was probably, you know, it was listed at 352. It was probably more of a 340, 342 home. Yeah. They did have some, you know, like a, a real estate friend, she said, the owner said um, that, you know, helped them on their price, you know, but still it was over. There's no, you know, when you go into a listing appointment, Ray, you're, if they say, I think we have a 350 house and you, you'll you boom, here's some data to say why it's not a 350 house. Right. And here's how you could chase the market down. You don't want to do that. Right. Um, so, you know, that's kind of the, the first thing off was price. So, um, and just kind of but this, as a backup talking about real yeah. estate friend, if you're a real estate agent who does this for your friends, you're really doing them a disservice because what you're doing mm -hmm. is saying that this is the average of homes sold on the market. So even if yep. they were to list for sale by owner, we know that they don't get a quarter or an eighth of the exposure that we could provide as agents on the market. So right. what the real question you need to ask is what would the home sell for without any exposure? then tell that to your friend. Yeah. And second off, if you're a real estate friend and you couldn't get the listing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, here's somebody coming to you for help and you can't convert. Yeah. I mean, come on, brush up on scripts. Yeah. Let's do something there. Cause super easy <laughs> script. I'm your friend and I'll list your home. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I mean, so I, I don't know, but I think this was actually a somewhat in area agent, you know, not within 10 miles, but within less than 30 and she didn't get the listing. Um, but it, the disservice thing is huge. And, um, you know, additionally, even if you're out of area and you're giving, giving him this opinion, get him a referral, you know, get him someone that you've found or you know close that can really help him out and guide him through the process. Cause we're all jumped to from there is, and I never really thought about it before cause I, I had seen FISBOs and, um, but I'd never been in escrow on one. So what I immediately realized was these guys are unprotected. Yeah they have no broker helping them out. So if anything goes awry, my broker is essentially going to, you know, ruin them. There, there's no way, you know, they would just have an avalanche of lawyers all over them. You know, they, they're totally unprotected in, you know, with these contracts, there's so much fine print. If you don't have, you know, uh, a, an actual agent reading through them for you, then you have your TC, which helps, you know, eyes, uh, eyes on those contracts, your broker, your uh, standards and practices, your E and O, like you're totally unprotected here. And so um, what they really missed out on is, I don't know about your markets, Ray, but we, a lot of time on the listing, if we see some things in the home that are kind of iffy or termite, we'll have inspections done up front. So when we did our inspection, I mean, it was just an avalanche for them. The home looked nice, but it was it was really, really rough. And there was no one to tell them that because they're the homeowners and they have the most special home in the neighborhood, right? Right. Lipstick on a pig. Exactly. And this one was that. They didn't even have cleanouts for, and there was no cleanouts for any of their sinks. Nothing. Not a clean out. That's weird. Uh, yeah. So you, the if there's a clogger, you can't clean out. Um, you know, and just so many other problems with the home. And they also bought it on their own. They didn't have an agent. They oh. went straight to the seller. So they had kind of a half you know, hearted um, inspection, didn't bring up much. So we were bringing up all these issues, which were legit. And they were just blown away and, you know, they had to cancel. And then the end of the story is now they're listed with an agent and it's 25 grand less, which is about ballpark for them, knowing the issues with the home and where it should actually be listed. It's about 325, 330 now. So. Wow. 
Yeah. Yep. That's a that's a huge issue. When whenever I I yeah. walk through a home, previewing it to possibly list it, one of the things I'm checking is above the doors. I'm looking around, you know, the baseboard, see if there's any termite damage, all that stuff. Because we we have our termites are a huge issue here. So um, yeah, same here. Just kind of alerting the seller to those things on the front end goes a long way mm-hmm. to what I call bulletproof the transaction on the back end. And yeah. letting them know, hey, somebody's going to come in and pick apart your house from top to bottom. So how sure are you that everything is fine? If they're not very yeah. sure, if they haven't maintained their home well, I always recommend a pre-listing inspection is what we call it here. Yeah. And we do the same thing as well. And my partner, who is the listing agent, um, he's great with that stuff. And, and he's great about not making it overwhelming. You know, he doesn't say your house is jacked up. We need to fix stuff <laughs> up front. <laughs> right. But it's more of a, we're letting you know that, you know, same thing, top to bottom. Um, and also just guidance if the home is super cluttered or if it has kind of beat up carpet and for 2,500 bucks, we could get you another five or 10 grand right. with hardwood floors in here. That's all that guidance that you don't have with, with without a um, without an agent there for you. So, you know, I know it's a tough thing for them with, you know, if you just do the math, 3% and 3%, it's a lot, but all the stuff you're lacking without that, you're not saving money at all. Yep. And so the second half of this study is they used automated valuations, which is something that when it's really funny, because I guess when uh, consumers saw automated valuations coming, they were like, oh, sweet, we don't need agents, we don't need appraisers, we don't need people in the real estate industry. So right. they use that same tool because it is equally wrong across the boards. Automated valuations <laughs> as agents, we yeah. know how far off those things are. If you're looking at this estimate, yeah. try to figure out your home value. It's not worth the paper it's written on, which is no paper anymore, but you know. So uh, those things are so far off because what they're doing is they're they're using a computer model to try to find similar homes in square footage, bedrooms, bathrooms, and area. But the, the computer models don't really know the areas that well. So they're going within like a mile of your yep. home or two mile radius of your home. Yeah. But there are very specific things that they miss, like maybe the neighbor down the street had green shag carpet. So here yeah. you are being told that this value of your home is lower than what you thought. And that's because that one sold down the street and it was a total remodel and the computer doesn't know that. Nope. So automated valuations are off. But what I love about this study is that they use them because it's a baseline. They're yeah. all off. That's so, their control. Yeah. Yeah. So that's their control. So using that as a baseline and then using some averages of commission, I love how they calculated that. So now yeah. real estate industry, I don't, I don't know if collateral analytics is with the real estate industry, but even just a study coming out using that as a standard data point. I love that because it just shows uh, that you do need an agent's first, I think it's the first study to show with that as a control, yeah. the difference in what a home sells for, for sale by owner versus using an agent and the agent makes more than their money back normally. So, or the, the seller makes more than the agent costs. Totally. So a, a good agent should pay you to list their home, right? Exactly. Gonna, with how much you're going to make back. Correct. And that's, yeah. um, and that's exactly kind of how we say it. What I do like about it, the the, the kind of automated um, value opinions, um, is that it does, because I'm a big proponent of empowering my clients with knowledge. So I do what's called um, buyer consultations. And it is an extra step, but it's an hour, hour and a half up front. And it's just, it's the entire process. There's wants, needs, we go through everything. And then we talk about the process. It's especially amazing for first time buyers, obviously. Um, but even if you're on your 10th home, the market changes so much, you know? Um, but so I love that it's out there and people get an idea of value so they can kind of watch the market on their own. But if you're not, if you don't have something set up directly from the MLS, you're, I mean, I see things off like 20% sometimes. They're like, I think my home is worth 500 grand. No, it's like a four ten house. Yeah. yeah. Not even close. You know, yeah, we, in, so, in yeah. Arkansas, every, I mean, there's a lot of unique properties, so it's way off in some parts. That's true too. Yeah. When we get into like the, the old school, you know, um, colonials or, or craftsmen's, but it's, it's comparing homes that were built in 1970 right. to something in 1922 that's historical. Yeah. That's not right. So let's move on to the second topic. Cause I think we're going to have a fight. Does the new iPhone affect real estate is kind of the topic, but however, you should know, Dan, that I've never missed an Apple keynote since the first time when wow. Steve jobs was up there saying, that you have a communicator and yeah. you know a phone and music and he kept saying it and over then the and touch over. screen yeah. yeah and you realized it was all one thing that's when i started 
watching Apple keynotes. So I don't know if there were any yeah. before that, but I've never missed an Apple keynote. So, uh, you know, I even live streamed this, this Apple keynote <laughs> on Facebook and talked about it, knowing I knew yeah, everything I that they that. were going to announce. Cause I had already looked at all the spoilers and stuff. So I'm, That's a, I'm, I'm talking to you on an iMac. I have an iPhone, iPads. I'm an I person. I, you, <laughs> yeah. And you said droid earlier. So, yeah, I'm, I'm literally all of those things that you said. I'm all of the opposite of that. Okay, good. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> so yeah, I, the question I posed was, does the new iPhone, will it have an effect on real estate? What say you? Look, okay. I don't, it, to me, out of all the things, and I have a bunch of specs here. So let's start with, let me see where we go. Yeah, you even found a couple of surprising it. things, right? Yeah. Oh, that? cool. The angels. <laughs> I got some angel stuff up here. I'm an angels fan. So that's popping up just in my feed <laughs> randomly. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of try to tie it all into, is it going to change real estate or not? I mean, the short answer is to me, no. Um, it's, it's doing a lot of things that other phones have already done, but where, where do iPhones um, excel? I think their cameras have always been superior and they're always pushing that envelope. So that's great. Cause I don't want this to come off like I'm just bashing Apple products because I do in my, I do constantly, like literally when I'm not on here or doing real estate, I, you know, my wife's like, dude, shut up. I don't even care. I have an, a Samsung too. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone that'll listen, I'm bashing it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, great phones. Their battery life has always been amazing. Um, now I feel, and you'll know better than I, cause I still watch keynotes when, um, you know, they're big ones. Like I remember when, that touchscreen came out. I mean, right. that was just like, I remember I was working at uh, the video game company. It was just like, all of us were just, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Remembering watching that. What was that? Yeah. 10, 11 years ago. Yeah. Probably. Yeah, this was uh, the 10th anniversary. So yeah. Yeah. Ooh, Apple X. Um, yeah. Makes a whole bunch of sense. Um, <laughs> you know, and everything was Blackberry and they had that little roller, yeah. which was kind of cool. And you could the do the cursor around and then it, Boom, done. That BlackBerry hasn't been heard of since. Um, but so here's, and I, I don't know if they correlate exactly, but I feel like Jobs was always pushing it. Right. Almost to a fault, meaning he didn't care about what you wanted. He gave you what you wanted, Right. which is what I loved about him. It's, it's kind of a dicky move, but it, he knew what you wanted and he put it, you know, it was so brilliant. Everything was, then you're like, I have to have that. So I felt like the frenzy was bigger. Now Tim Cook seems to be more following trends or trying to keep up. You know, I, I don't want to dog the guy. I think he's an important um, part of tech. I just, you know, I feel like it's always catching up. So the article I brought up, it's uh, Apple's, it's, uh, let's see, what's the web? It's on Forbes. Uh, Apple's new iPhones may have a nasty, or do have a nasty surprise. And as you read through, you know, it gives all the positive. It's redesigns. It's got the full um, screen display, which again, on my Samsung, theirs is a little bigger, but mine, if you can see it, uh, let me bring it up. Come on. As I fail. See, it's got a full big screen on it. It's skinny. I can unlock it with my finger uh, as it doesn't work there. I unlocked it with <laughs> my finger. Um, you know, it's got all those cool parts to it as well. Uh, but it gives all those positives up front. And then as you start reading, everyone knows what, what, what's the cost on the X going to be, Ray? Nine ninety nine, nine ninety nine, And that's for 64 gig. Yeah. 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 If you want two fifty six, right. I think you're in the 12, uh, 1150, 1200 range. Yes. Yeah, I should say starting at nine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Soothing room tones. <laughs> that's right. Sorry, side joke, people. Um, yeah, it's right here. So yes, despite Apple pricing its new phones as high as 1149, not a single one of the iPhones will come with a fast charger. So they finally caught up. My, I had a six and I skipped the seven Samsung uh, Galaxy, Galaxy S6. Skipped the seven, now I have an eight. I get a new phone every two years, which a lot of people do. Um, I've been fast charging since the six. So this is nothing new for me. This is three years ago, but the catch is it doesn't come with the charger. <laughs> so right. out the box, you cannot fast charge. And I remember when they first made, I guess it was the last keynote when they introduced one Jack, everything's through one Jack, right? Yeah. Seems it felt like a ploy to sell a bunch of extra stuff to me Yeah. as of kind of 
I'll stop there. What do you think about just that, the extra stuff thing? So, I mean, most of the people who purchase Apple don't care. I'm, I'm looking forward to having a couple <laughs> of pads around the house that you can set your phone on and charge them. I'll probably have one at yeah. the office, one by my bed, and then one somewhere downstairs, yeah. you know? So, you know, that's probably, a, a, I'm guaranteeing those are going to be like 100, 150, something like, I don't even know how much those cost yet, but that's. that's they don't have, they have not released that yet. Yeah. yeah. This article says it's going to be the Apple Air Power mat. Yeah. So I'm, you know, I'll probably have one of those. Wife will probably have one of those. So I, you know, I don't, I don't think that's a huge concern because we're kind of used to it. <laughs> Like, but isn't that a bad thing? <laughs> well, I don't, you know, I, it's so to me, it's worth it to have the technology. Right. To have the. But so. Sorry to interrupt. On, again, on the catching up thing is I've been able to walk into a Starbucks for two years and just I don't have to do a thing with this phone. I set it down. Uh, there's no special setting. I set it down and right. it's charging. Right. It's got the little circular thing, you know, so it's again, it's a catching up thing. I don't, I, you know, I have, it comes with my little charger that I can plug in, which by the way, we had to play catch up. This had to play catch up because now it's a universal. I can put it in. One of the annoying things on these phones is if you put it in the wrong way, you're just like, Oh, I just grinded it up. <laughs> my charger's not going to work. And then after a year, your charger's loose and not charging the phone. Oh no. So we, they caught up there. So now it's either way. It doesn't matter. It's nice and easy as I struggle to put it in. Um, so on the on the cheap charging but, thing, I think that's going to make Apple's change to that, uh, or Apple's, um, I guess you could say, adoption of that. I think that's going to help further that. So I mean, uh, one of the things that told yeah. a friend was Android users should be praising Apple for finally adopting that because now adopting, the mass market yeah. has it, and that's going to be yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Now I wanted to ask a question because um, I'm going to get I'm going to break down actual prices in a second, and then we can kind of finish up with how does it affect real estate. Um, uh, you know, what do you think this is going to, are people going to go, dude, I, I don't have, I want the top of the line phone. I want the biggest, uh, um, you know, the memory on with the 256 gigs. I can't afford that much money and then pay for all the extra stuff. Do you think this is going to hurt their brand a little bit? No, I, you know, I think, um, they've always been more of the BMW versus the Honda Civic. Yeah, um, I think there's a lot of utilitarian phones out there that I think you just be... said I have a Civic. <laughs> <laughs> maybe I don't know. No, there's some there's some uh, other phones, uh, maybe Jags or something. Maybe the high end Androids, but like yeah. Apple is also still offering the five SE or whatever it is, the stripped yeah. down, small, looks like a thin pack of cigarettes phone. They also yeah, still but those are those are now the six... phones that the bad guys use use for burners. <laughs> Yeah, that's true too. But those, they still have those at a very, very, very right. reasonable price point. So if you want to be in the Apple uh, ecosystem, you can still enter at about what it would cost you for a mid range Android. You could have a, I, I would say, low end Apple, right? right? I think it only helps their brand because it's an, it's an aspirational purchase for a lot of people. Uh, so, yeah. so for me, for example, even in real estate, I've, I'm not just going to shell out the money. I want to make, based on what we've averaged, I want to make a little more than what I have averaged just so I can earn it. And so, yeah, and that's, me, that's a big thing in real estate. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I just don't want to sell, shell out the cash and say, well, here, I'm going to figure out how to pay for it later. I know when it's coming right. out. I know when I'll have to pay for it. So I might as well, you know, start saving now and make the purchase. So it's, and it's also a tool which we could get to in a minute. But, I think always having something, somebody's going to be top of the line out of all the phone makers yes. out there. We can all agree. Right. It's not windows. <laughs> no. It's not windows. It's not, you know, but the cool thing about Android is that there's a lot of different phone makers. You know, Samsung is probably yeah. one of the high end uh, yes. phone makers for droid. I think sure. Apple is the high end phone maker for Apple. There's no one else that yeah. can make an Apple. So they have to make something that's high no. end and they have to also have something that's at right. more of an entry level. And the, one of the issues that I have with the X or 10 is that it might be hard to get. I heard a report the other day yeah. saying that one of the reasons why it's delayed a month is because they can only make 10,000 a day. So in a month, that's only 30,000 or 300. Is that 300? Oh. Yes. 300,000. Yeah. Well, the demand for this is going to way outpace the number that they can make. 
So yeah. I think that's another reason why they could get away with having a really high purchase price is because it's not going to be available. So most, and that's why they released yeah. the eight and the eight S most people are going to say, well, I want an upgraded phone. I'm just going to go with that. So personally, then, I'm uh, hoping a lot of people buy the eight and the eight S now because they don't, can't right. wait. You know, I don't want to wait. And then right. that releases some of that demand so that by the time that comes out, I can go buy it, but it's going to be a fight right. to get it. Yeah. And then, Going back to prices of these things, so it breaks it down. Uh, this is all the different phones from the eight to the eight plus to the X uh, iPhone X. Sixty-four gigs gonna be a hundred, like Ray said, and then eleven forty-nine for the two fifty-six. The eight sixty-nine, six ninety-nine, and I think I just wanted to say sixty-nine, six ninety-nine and eight forty-nine respectively. Eight hundred nine forty-nine. So they're still more expensive, right? You know, than because I think my phone I looked it up it was. 650 but if you go with this carrier then it's 500 or 600 or whatever but now they have those payment plans i think yeah. my opinion would be that would alleviate some of this too because they're not like i gotta write a check right now or throw 1149 dollars on my card right now well i, I don't even instead yeah, it's part of your plan i don't even think they've released an unlocked version of the x so i think you have to go through a carrier and then there's right. always temptation there to get zero percent financing through the carrier and you just yeah. add it to your phone bill. And that's what, you know, the last time we went, that's yeah. what we did is we added a, I think I'm on a seven right now. And so we added that to the phone bill and then over two years paid. So now it's, it's done and I can either trade that in, get a big discount on the X or I can keep it. You know, usually you just pass it to your kids yeah. and then get the X and then do another payment plan or you can just shell out the cash. So it, yeah. actually mathematically it worked out the same. So yeah. And I, I think that's thing. just kind of part of people's thinking. And I think you have a very healthy thought process on, you know, I'm not just going to struggle to afford this phone. I'm going to make enough or more to afford it. Um, Cause then you go towards the fast wired chargers another 50 bucks. But if you go with the higher end one, it's 80 uh, lightning to USB cable is another 35. We don't know the air power yet, but you were saying hundred, 150 probably. That's what I'm guessing. And then the air pods wireless charging is 70. So, I mean, you're well into this thing for like 1400 bucks for a phone. Yeah. But think you know? about the relationship that people have with their phone. Right. Yeah. How many times a day do you look at it? How many times a day do you touch it? How many times, you know, it's usually the first thing yeah. you touch besides your spouse, maybe, and maybe, yeah. right. So maybe you, you wake up and look and see what time it is. Nobody has alarm clocks. They look at their phone, you know, before they go yep. to bed, they look, see what time it is. You know, go into bed, set alarms. Nobody, my watch doesn't even work. <laughs> It's just for looks. I look at my, nope, just for looks. I look at my phone. So just in given how much of my life I'm going to be spending with this device, yeah. I would rather spend the money on something that I really want to hold, use, that just works. Because I'm kind of a yeah. hacker. So if I had a droid, I'd be tinkering with that thing all the time, like doing cool things and changing around things and all that. Right. So uh, I think I'm okay being into it 1400 maybe $1,500 because it's such a part of everything I do in life in general, but also in real estate. I mean, that's right. how, you know, when I first started shooting videos, it was on an iPhone. Yeah. So it's, it's totally changed now how a lot of people do business in real estate itself because of the technology right. housed in that little box. So that's where like, is this going to be a game changer or was the iPhone a game changer when it first came out with the great camera, the battery life and all that stuff. So, I don't know if this one will, because I, again, I think they're kind of playing catch up on certain features, but their cameras have always been amazing. You know, um, well, here's the here's the big change for me: augmented reality. Yeah, that could be the game changer because they're already showing demos of like little Disney characters where you could just hit a button and it adds a Disney character to some kind of environment. So that's Disney that's cool. advertising, yeah. marketing themselves through this. Well, what if somebody well, could? you know, look at a house, say they drive up to a house, they see this house, they could hold yeah. their phone up and t as they're taking a picture of the house, it says tap here for a augmented an AR version. So they tap there right. and there I am standing in front of the house saying, Hey guys, thanks so much for checking out this property. Let me tell you a little bit yeah. about it and takes them into a video. Let's them walk through the house and all that kind of stuff. That's where I yeah. think we're getting there and it took something like an apple that was capable of augmented reality which that's been done for now four or five years they've been doing augmented mm -hmm. reality virtual reality the droids yeah. have had it i think for two years on some of your phones but now yes. like just like the chi charger will be mass adopted because of apple i think augmented reality is going to start to be mass adopted because of apple yeah the number one phone for millennials is apple yeah i think that's a 
Great point. I, you know, I don't think about that way because I'm not an Apple guy, but is it, if that's considered the standard or uh, the mass uh, market, the main market, then, and it's, it's taking on things like they were like, I don't know about that yet, but now they've accepted it. I think that's a big deal. Cause you know, there's been things and I, you know, like you can do, um, you know, I, before there was any sort of kind of live, like, uh, what do you call it? FaceTime? Right. Um, or through messenger, they have that now I would record walkthroughs for my out of area clients and then, uh, Dropbox them to them or Google docs to them, you know, so they could, um, uh, so they could see the home. Now this right. is just like live. They don't even have to show up. You're just walking through it. And if you could do it pre-recorded where they just tap a button and you, you recorded it, what, 10 minutes ago, an hour ago, two days ago, whatever. Right. Uh, that's a big game changer, changer to me, especially yeah. for being a buyer agent. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. And you could hear comments from the uh, seller or from the seller and seller's agent right there in front of the property too. Yeah. I think it could be, we'll kind of wait and see, but I think augmented reality has a place in real estate and everybody's trying to figure yeah. out exactly what that is. But I think it's more than trying to set a set a chair or a couch in your living room. Yeah. And Hey, we didn't fight. <laughs> That's right. Not too bad. And you called my phone a civic, but I'll <laughs> let it go. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get into the value insured study. So there's several other statistics on this that I wanted to punch out. Uh, home prices in my area are overvalued and unsustainable. 57% of all homeowners think that. 80% of millennial home buyers think that or home owners think that. Why do they think that? That is the question. Well, they haven't lived long, right? I mean, yeah, they don't know. I, I say this as a, as the, I think I'm the eldest millennial born in 82. We're right between the X and the millennial generation. Yeah. Some people call us the Oregon Trail year. So it's a uh, good. being born in 82, we lived our life without uh, computers or technology until we were about 13 or 14. Yeah. Right. Then we were in junior high and high school with a computer or a computer room, computer classes with America online. Yeah. Right. Then we went to uh, yeah, dial up. Then we went to college <laughs> and we, if you graduated in four years, graduated college without Facebook. So in 2005, yeah. Facebook launched to the campuses worldwide. And uh, yeah. so we're, I'm a weird generation. And I think it's my opinion, but I think millennials feel a little bit like they're owed something in general. And they're very mobile. Yeah. They've been the most mobile generation for years. And I think one of the concerns is when they buy today at the top of the market, are they going to get hosed when they sell in two to three years? Right. I know that's where you have to watch the market. Are they overthinking it? Have they watched the market too much? Have they put too much um, importance on those, that study that we spoke about earlier with those um, automated values? You know, are they giving too much credence to that? You know, that's where I would really worry about it, that they're just going to stop. I don't even need an agent to talk to, but that, then that makes them afraid of the market. Right. You know, that would, that could be a twofold a disaster, you know? Yeah. And I think the other thing that they're, they may not be thinking about is right now we still have historically low rates and rates are going up and rates yes. could cost a lot more than a change in price of homes. That's how we say it. When we're talking to someone that's a seller and also a buyer, you know, I don't know if you can see my hands here, you're going to be another geez percent. Like you're not, it's not going to be that big a difference, but if even if it went up 1%, we're still historically low, crazy low. Like 7% yeah. would be still fine. When my father-in-law bought a home in 1992, it was 17%. You know, if you look back through, and then the early 80s, it was 19%. So historically, we're good. I mean, over 30 years, that's going to cost you could make. And, and then you get into predict the market thing. If, the, if, if we're t speaking to consumers, don't ever, ever, ever try to predict the market. Right. People that have studied way more than me have failed at it. it yeah. Just don't try to predict the market. Try to leverage yourself, you know, and now is just simply the best time to be doing that because interest rates are still at 4%, you know? Yep, exactly. Uh, the other part of the study, more, uh, we actually talked about this a little bit earlier, uh, more homeowners expect price correction and see now's the time sell 58%. Mm -hmm. I uh, think there will be a correction in the next two years. 83% of people think now is the time to sell. 
I, th I thought that was really interesting because there's a lot of people that are still asking me what rates are going to do and what home prices are going to do in the future. And I always tell them, I don't know, but if you need to move, now's the time to move. Exactly. And I've said, I've been kind of expecting a big change and they did go up a little bit. But now they've kind of dipped back down. Um, they've stayed, they've held. So now it's like every day is another, how long are they going to hold? That's kind of my, uh, on the buy side solely, that's kind of my, how long are they going to hold? So to me, it's more of a, if you're thinking about if you have to sell or you have to move or you have to buy, what are you waiting for? What's the holdup? If it's a credit issue, let's fix it. If it's right. not enough down payment, let me see if I can help you with assistance. You know, you know I mean, let's get to it, talking to a lender and go. And what's the value of owning your home versus trying to be an investor? Yeah. That's the other conversation I have with buyers is are we, you know, when they're like, well, I want to get a good deal on the house, ask them, are you an investor or are you want to be a homeowner? Because in this market, if you want to be a homeowner, you're going to pay right. about market value for the home. There's nothing wrong with that. Right. This other part of the study, it's in yeah. blue here. It says, if I were to buy a home today, I'm confident that it would be worth more next year. Only 48% of home buyers thought that their home would go up in value next year. 43% yeah. of millennials uh, thought it would go up next year. So most of them believe that if they were to buy a home today, it will go down. This yeah, is more than 50% of both uh, for both cases. Yeah, which I guess it's it's nearly 50%. So I guess it's a shot in the dark, right? <laughs> yeah, hey, it could or could not. But it could or could not. Again, uh, if it's a price correction, then it'll be like a, you know, it won't be like a, you know, the tail wagging crash, it like, right. yeah, crash like it was before it was a big, you know, tail wagging and everything just went, you know, things that were worth 550 were worth 275 and right. areas that should never be worth 550 were worth 550. It, yeah, it's like where I live specifically in my farm, it is very stable. I have you know, our home, we bought it for 410,000. It's now worth 468 over four years. It's a very steady increase. Yeah. Do I think it's going to keep doing that forever? No. But do I think it'll plateau? Yes, absolutely. But to think you're going to make, again, the investor thing, to think you're going to make a bunch of money in a year. Yeah. No, this is a long-term thing. Lock yourself in. Right. And if things change in five to seven years or three to five, like which is more the case nowadays, Let's see where you're at and leverage that. But and most people, you, know, you got to think moving. about a long-term like, thing. You wouldn't move next year if you thought the market was going to go down in three years just because you want to cash out on your equity. Most no. people don't move for that reason. Most people move because they're uh, expanding their family or they're downsizing mm -hmm. or job changes or yeah. whatever. So it's it's not like everyone's trying to get a a, a good deal or um, you know sell at the top of the market. That's very few people are actually going to try to sell at the top of the market. So what do you do? Yeah. Well, you can, like you were saying, start to leverage yourself. So as soon as you start mm -hmm. to see the world go on sale, have the money there waiting to start purchasing. Yeah. Just yeah. I, I just, huh? So just call Dan, the buyer specialist. Yeah. You just call me. <laughs> Unless you're in Arkansas, then we got to call Ray. That's right. All right. So let's do our uh, bonus story. Normally we're going to dig into three or four of the stories at length. This time I added one bonus. It is uh, a study by Inman. Oh, it's not really a yeah. study. It's just an article by Inman that Dan this is has not read. I have so, not seen it. I can't see it. <laughs> right. 15 crazy real estate myths your clients believe. So uh, number one, this yeah. is going to hurt. This is going to hurt you a little bit. Real yeah. estate agents are paid a salary. <laughs> that No. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that also so they're right. saying that people believe this. Yeah. They're saying that people believe that real estate agents are paid a salary, which I could see because the... I get it for a broker. Right. So I could see some of that. Yeah. They don't understand the whole self-employed thing. Um, right. They don't understand. They, some people cannot even fathom 100% commission. You know, it's right. like when I tell them, you know, no, I'm hundred percent commission. There's no like stipend at the end of every month. No, it's, I have to go interview for a new job every time I meet a new client, you know, you know, what? Um, maybe we should stop saying 100% commission because I think that gets to myth number two. The uh, agent keeps all the commission. Ah, yeah. Well, uh, just to <laughs> piggyback the two, because uh, on the buy side, I say it at the end of um, just to remind everyone, because there's a lot of agents out there. I won't say a lot. There's, uh, there's a chunk. Remember, California has a ton of licensed agents, which makes it a frenzy and can bring out the sketchy people. There are some buyer's agents that charge their clients. Yeah. Even though, so if let's say it's a two and a half percent listing, which is very standard around here on the meaning just the buy side, uh, whatever that is to get them to 3%, that will be their client paying them. Yeah. We have agents that do that too. And the way they do it here is yeah. like, I don't, I don't mind 
if you want to charge a premium for your premium buyer services, that's fine. Yeah. But be upfront with them. Don't yeah. sneak it into the contract and then right. say in the closing cost, seller to pay up to this much in closing cost prepaids and professional fees. That's right. Sneaky. Yeah. Oh, and, by the way, <laughs> um, we all, I always counter that. We're like, no, you want, yeah. you want your client to pay you more. You get your client to pay you more. Yeah. So, and then, so I always tell them at the end of that, my services, everything, all this awesomeness is free <laughs> to you. If you've ever talked to another agent that was going to charge you on the buy side, that doesn't happen. So, um, sure. all right. What well, was so the number two again? Number two is keep 100% on the commission. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the, what, this right. is another thing they can't know because right. they're not with a brokerage. They don't know what, they have no idea what splits are. That you, when you say that, they just, you know, yep. but I'm part of a company that's flat fee. So, um, you know, but we still offer all of the, and I don't want this to turn into a pitch. <laughs> right, right. But we still offer all the training and stuff because one of the co-founders, my partner, is he's just a natural trainer and he loves doing it. Um, if you guys saw me do this, you know, <laughs> earlier, that was him walking in. Um, he just loves doing it. So it's a part of our culture as well. And a lot of us come from other companies that have that as part of their culture. So I like that model because A, I get to still learn, but I'm not giving up geez, 40, 50 percent of right. my commission. So. Well, and it also depends on yeah. taxes, expenses, because uh, number yeah. four says an agent's gas mileage and other transportation expenses are reimbursed. And uh, no, no. It, written off, yes. Okay. But I think if I'm correct, I get to write two thirds off right. of my total gas mileage, which on the buy side is a lot. So, but yeah, no, there's no reimbursement. Again, there's no, mm -hmm. we're independent contractors, essentially. We, yep. like a tiny, we have our- A tiny, small business. Yes, just a tiny little small business with a big beard. <laughs> Mark, did we skip three? No, that was uh, three was typical commission is 6%. Oh, yeah, maybe we did. We did. Uh, but you talked a little bit about the difference in percentages. It depends on where you are in the transaction. Are you on the buy side, sell side? Yeah. The commission is also split between, uh, you know, with broker reciprocity, another agent in the market. I just thought these were yeah. really interesting. I've run into several of these. I mean, of course, commission is always negotiable. Uh, but there are some markets that have a super low. There's some markets that are super high. So yeah, that, there is no, there is no typical, especially for the antitrust laws. Yeah. We have a lot of discount brokers and it's frustrating. I know you have some in your area in our conversations. We have a lot here. I mean, billboards that say I'll sell your house for 1%. Now, and Jacob and I, my partner have, um, we had this conversation on the way back because we were driving from kind of a 45 minute away drive listing um, one of our new team listings and, uh, the we're boom, billboard, billboard, billboard now. And we were like, well, would we rather keep our integrity intact? And we charge 3% for on the listing side for our, what we do, but we, I, it doesn't matter the house, hundred thousand dollar house, hundred million dollar house. We're doing video. We're doing high end picks, right? We're doing all of our marketing, um, the same social media presence where we're, uh, targeting ads. I mean, you get it no matter what. So, that's kind of factored into why we make the 3%, right? Yep. Um, but there are so many out here, just discounts. So then their side would be just get them through the process. Just put them through the mill. There's no connection. There's no long-term. Um, you know, there's not a lot of referrals. If you just kind of, all right, you know, get the pictures, get it going, um, you know, get them through. Cool. That one's an escrow. Get it, get them out of here. You know, that's, you know, and I also think, um, you know, kind of jumping off the 6% thing that what we do, our team specifically is going to be, if there is a dip to tie all these subjects in, if there is a troubled market, what we do will prove to be the way to go. Right. More because we actually sell homes. We don't just put them on the MLS, put a sign in the yard, then pray someone else sells them. We actually sell and market homes. Yep. You know, those are my thoughts. This is another good one. A home passes or fails inspection. I hear that a lot. Did we pass inspection? It's like, well, that's the opinion of the Oh, buyer. like it's black or white? Yeah. <laughs> or like it's a city doing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, I have to explain to them interesting. the opinion of the buyer. Yes. And that I cover in, um, again, my buyer's consults. Yep. Have I told you guys I do buyer's consults? <laughs> well, let me go ahead uh, and read 7 too, because it's, it's with this. Inspectors have to find something, don't they? Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a huge one. I see that all the time. Yeah. Um, so I'll tackle the first one. And again, I cover it in my <laughs> buyer's consultations. Um, and then how that first part is pass or fail. 
you know, so I've, I've already kind of covered, but then how my inspector that I use says it, he said, this isn't a fix it list. I'm not giving you a list of everything that has to be fixed on the home. This is more of a, we're letting you know the current condition of the home. This is part of your discovery period. Then if there's anything that bugs you, we can move forward right. from there. So it's, it's not a pass or fail thing. Right. So, but, um, I don't, I guess I kind of hear that, but then I hear, what was the next one? The inspectors uh, have to find something. Yeah. I, I hear that all the time. Now I've never seen, and uh, our inspector says the same thing. He's never seen a perfect home. There's not a perfect home. One of the worst homes I've ever had inspected that I was in escrow on was a brand new construction home. Yep. It, it was horrible. It wasn't finished. There was this missing and that missing, you know, so everything, they're going to find something on everything. Um, but if it's a clean house and he just finds w missing window screens and cracked pavement, He's not making things up. He's not looking for things. He he doesn't they have standards they have to go know. by anyway. Yeah, they have standards. They have yeah. guidelines as well. But Ashy. it's not that he has to find something. It's just every home has something. They always find something. Right. Weekends bring yeah. out the most serious buyers. Weekends? Yeah, that's what it says. I didn't know that people thought that. I mean, weekdays, those are, those are my most serious clients. I would say that, yeah, when they're when they go to work until 4 or 5 p.m. and then they're and still they're going, really that's more serious house. to me. Yeah. And I say the same thing about buyers that are looking during the fall and the winter yep. those are the more serious buyers yep. like they're they're not moving because little they have to no they want to buy a house you know so i would say it's the opposite the, that's what i would say too during the week zillow says therefore it is zestimates we kind of already had <sighs> that one so we don't have to spend much time but and it just makes me angry when people well my house says you know the well, zestimate i think we says. should offer this because that's what the zestimate says uh, <laughs> no. it's better to no. price a home on the high side the seller can always come down no i touched on that earlier that's chasing the market down yeah. so as a you know i do a lot of listings and that's one of the worst things you could do the market will always correct when you list up and just for a crazy example if you took a one million dollar house and you listed it for two hundred thousand, where would it sell right it would probably sell way over way way over two hundred thousand. might even make it over a million so the market will always correct um so yes it, it, and that's kind of the part of the the wizardry of it. Will it correct to where it should have been? I don't know. Yeah. But the having the thought, if you correct downward, it's more painful, and you will go lower than it would have had it corrected. Up. Yeah. Exactly. You know, if we try to price things with a strategy, you know, there's like, if there's like a bubble, you know, the low side and the high side in the middle, just under that. kind of the sweet yep. spot is here, just yep. under it to. You know, if it's maybe a 410 house, we're going to push for a price of 399. Again, most eyeballs because in the first 3 weeks, 85% of the people that are going to see that home are seeing it. So, if you do miss it, you need to a drop your price before that 3 weeks so to to, to still keep it um uh to to still keep it active. Why can't I say that? Um <laughs> that's so weird. Okay. Um but you know, chasing it down is is just the worst way to go. This one's right up your alley. When making an offer yeah. at home, you start with a low offer. It's kind of the opposite of what we just heard on the seller's side. Yeah, I um, I just say every, and again, in my consult, I say everything, to me, every single home is its own little. Yeah. If every home, every seller situation is different. You don't it's all different. Know. Even if you had the exact same home, the exact same everything, this motivation is different than this motivation. It's so yeah, I mean, you have to and, understand that if you start with a low offer and they get three other offers that night, they may just take one of the others because you scared them with your low one. And you won't even, not even get a counter. You won't even get a counter, which is the worst case scenario. You don't even know where they stand, you know? So yeah, no. The longer the home is on the market, the more negotiable the deal. We kind of covered that one with every home being a, it's yeah. a situation. Sure. Kind of multiple price reductions means the seller is desperate to sell. It probably means they price too high on the high side. <laughs> I think they just, they just missed, it, missed it, you know, and they didn't get any offers, but it also depends on how long they've been on market. If they're reducing the price in the first two weeks very quickly and very, um, you know, big, big, big dips, then, then they're super motivated. Yeah. They're going to sell multiple yeah. offers gives the sellers an advantage. Mm, this is interesting. You, so yeah, it sounds, that sounds very right. But yeah. as someone who walks through those multiple offer situations with the seller, it's tormenting, right? Should they, here's the deal with multiple offers. A lot of agents will say, Hey, uh, we have multiple offer situations. Submit your highest and best offer tomorrow by five. And we'll review those. Yes. Well, if they haven't told the seller that 
it could be detrimental because I go back and tell my buyers and my buyers are like, oh, you know what? Let's don't, let's pull our offer on that one. Let's go offer on a different one. I don't want to be competitive. So now they don't have yeah. multiple offers. They just told me that they did, but they never told the sellers. So they haven't reached the sellers yet to let them know. So now right. they let the sellers know, well, we had multiple we did. offers, but now right. we only have one and maybe you're stuck with the worst one and they don't change the price. You've just yeah. your seller. So I always tell my sellers that I never will tell anyone that we have multiple offers until I've checked it with them first. Then once they give me the approval, there's a couple of different ways to play it. You could just counter one. You just take yeah. one, but I always tell them in our market, it's a little, it's less hot, I would say than probably yours. But if there's yeah. an offer in this bunch that allows you to do what you want to do, make the move you want to make, live the life you want to live, the best negotiation strategy you could do in that case is probably to take the offer. Because yeah. if you counter, or if you tell anyone in that group, Hey, it's multiple offers, they could all run away. And then you don't have anything. Yeah. So see, and for me specifically, I don't run away. I just, I let my client decide kind of like you're saying on the listing side is hey, they have multiple offers. I see the prices. It could get driven up. If it goes crazy, I say we walk. And, and if I kind of get that vibe, I say we move on to the next one because we're not going to overpay for things. It's, yep. I don't know going back. I don't know if it's going to, the market's going to keep going up to get you enough back. If it's five grand above, Sure. Let's stay in the market or in the, in the mix and see if we can compete. But yep. um, I would yep. never pull them from it. But um, yeah, I agree with you. Like wait until everything's been presented and then respond, yep. you know, and I always let my buyers kind of choose what they want to do. You know, when, whenever I bought my yeah. house, it was a multiple offer situation. Um, my own strategy that I tell my clients is to put in your walkaway offer to where if you were to hear someone tomorrow bought it for a hundred dollars more, you'd say, Phew, good for them. Glad we didn't offer that. And you'd be, yeah. With and, that's what we did. So when I bought my house, I put together a crazy offer. Uh, we bought our house for 410. Um, I beat an offer of 422 and 433. Those were never, ever going to appraise. The only reason I got it to appraise is because at 410, which we were a little bit under, but still, um, you know, so it's not about the price always, but I wrote crazy. I wrote this out and that out and was competitive in other ways. It's not always about the price. It's just not yep. in my markets. Number 15, last one, all agents are the same. <laughs> no. <laughs> You're looking at I mean, two dudes right now. No. I mean, similar good looks, but other than that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, mean <laughs> I just mean you and I together compared to the rest. No. Right, yeah. Um, but, I mean, dude, right here, iPhone. Yeah, Civic. <laughs> <laughs> So that's he, it. He likes being dumb. He don't. <laughs> there you go. So that's it for the talking points for uh, this episode. Uh, next, we'll get into the pick of the week, which we should uh, probably do pretty quick. So yeah, I have a quick one. Pick. Um, um, for for me, and this is because I didn't know which way we we're going to go, but it is if you are an agent type of thing. So if you're in the industry, um, there's an app out there called Magisto. M A G I S T O. Um. I've played with it a little bit. I haven't really put it into use yet. It's a newer thing to me. One of our colleagues kind of mentioned it and actually sent us a video that she made. It looked very, very professional. Um, you just take a couple of different video shots to do. You can put overlays on it, um, the price. You can flash this in. And that's all just on the free version. Nice. It's a pretty legit app. Um, and I wanted to add to that. Uh, you can go out and buy yourself a gimbal. The one Ray mentioned when we were uh, off air was a little more expensive, but it's super dialed. I think it's in the 500 range. Um, the DJ and there's DJ. another one. Yes. And it's kill. It's totally, that's what my, our, our uh, videographer uses. Uh, but you can get one for yourself for like a hundred, 200 bucks and you have a really good one. And then whatever phone you prefer, <laughs> um, just throw that in the gimbal and do your little walkthroughs and your, you know, it'll keep your phone steady. If you don't know what a gimbal is, that's the thing that keeps your phone steady. So you're not doing this as you walk through um, and get your cool self a cool different or a couple of cool different shots. And then boom, you know, throw it right into um, throw it right into the app. And there you go. You look like a professional and it didn't cost you that much money. You I know? Like it. I'll stick these into yeah. the uh, show notes as well. So they have links for it too. Magisto, oh. M-A-G-I-S-T-O. Magisto, yep. And I downloaded it. It's, there's there's a paid version where you can be a business. I, I don't remember. I think it was 20 bucks a month. Uh, you get a lot more, but there was great music selections. Um, you know, and it was just super simple. Oh, I, did, I didn't know what I was doing. So when I recorded a video, I talked in it because I talked yeah. too much, obviously. And um, the music will dip. So when you're talking, the music will dip. 
And then when you stop talking, oh, that's cool. You know, it'll it's it was it's just a cool little app, and I thought it was a great tip for you know people that want to kind of DIY it. Like it. My pick yeah. of the week is this website called Zylo. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new thing. Yeah. No, uh, so if you haven't tried the Cash App, uh, just Google Cash App. It's a green app on. I think it works for everything. Uh, I literally just used it. It's now how yeah. I pay, uh, like photographers, videographers they could send me a request for money using my uh, cell phone. I just click yes, it goes to them. Or they can say, hey man, the bill's 200 bucks. I could type 200, put their cell phone number in, say go, it goes. It also sends me a real estate, uh, a real estate. It sends me a receipt via email. It's noted on the account. So it's like super, super simple way to pay somebody. You don't have to get out your card. And it, I like, it's so much easier to use than PayPal or Venmo or anything like that, but it's called the cash app. So check that That's out. It's awesome. Well, thanks everybody for checking out the beard of men of real estate podcast. Like I said, this was our first one. So we look forward to episode two that should come. I think normally we're going to try to shoot these on uh, Thursday. Thursday yeah. uh, so if you have any articles or anything like that you want us to hit on, be sure to send it to us before then. Any suggestions, we also appreciate those. We'd be happy to take those. So you can find me on most social networks at Ray Zorback, R-A-Y-Z-O-R-B-A-C-K, because I'm a Arkansas Razorback fan. Dan, where can they <laughs> find you, man? Uh, my, my usual tag out there is just D Ludwig rocks, D L U D W I G. Um, that will be on essentially anything about Facebook, Facebook. I'm Dan Ludwig. Uh, but yeah, D Ludwig rocks. Awesome. Thanks guys. We'll see you next time. Thank you.